Hello and welcome. Uh, as we begin, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners on the land of which we meet today, the Ngunnawal people. It is upon their ancestral lands that the Academy of, Australian Academy of Science is built. And as we share our own knowledge, teaching and learning, and research practices, may we pay respect to the knowledge forever embedded within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. Good evening and welcome to the first of our Canberra Speakers Series for 2020. I am Dr Emma Beckett from the University of Newcastle and I'm one of the co-conveners of this series along with Dr TJ Higgins from CSIRO. Thank you all for joining us on this delectable journey of taste, health and food innovations at the home of Australian science excellence, the Shine Dome. Tonight we're going to hear about food waste which occurs across the entire food supply chain from production to farm to consumption by customers. I'd like to thank our presenting partner, the University of Canberra, for their ongoing support. We welcome staff and students from the science faculty who are here with us tonight. I also would like to thank uh, JIRA at Gia Station Wines for their continued support of this series, as well as Hoburg Catering and Elite Event Technology, who join us as new supporters for the event this year. Before we go any further, I've always wanted to do this. I have to say, if the evacuation alarm sounds, please move calmly to your nearest exit and assemble in the car park at the lower side of the Shine Dome. I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> Tonight, we are going to be taking our science well beyond the Shine Dome. There will be live tweeting. We invite you to join the conversation on Twitter for those who can't be here. Our hashtag is foodthoughts20. I have a list, but that was hard for me. Foodthoughts20. 20. 20 is 2-0, not the whole word. Foodthoughts20. We're also live streaming tonight. Um, hello to anyone watching at home on the live stream. If anyone has friends, family, cousins, uncles who are sad they're not here tonight, get on your phone right now. Tell them that they can watch on the Academy of Science Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. So whichever is your preferred platform, you can find it. We are everywhere. I hope there's some people watching and we're not having technical difficulties right now. Enough of me. I now have the pleasure of introducing tonight's first speaker, Mark Bartell. Mark is a special advisor at the Fight Food Waste Cooperative Research Centre. The Fight Food Waste CRC brings together industry, the community, to research how to reduce food waste, transforming unavoidable waste into new products and engaging with the community to drive change. Please join me to welcome Mark. Thank you, Emma, and good evening, everyone. Wow, I'm about to take you on a very interesting journey. It's part personal journey and part an overview of the global situation and, and where we find ourselves in Australia as well. So I'm really excited to, to have this opportunity to talk to everyone this evening. So, the personal journey bit. Back in 2004, uh, nearly 16 years ago now, I was just trolling through the BBC News website and I came across this article, Soggy Lettuce Tops Waste Hit List, and I thought, what's that about? 
And then I started reading the article, and, it, and I discovered that there was a survey of 2,000 adults in the UK by an insurance company looking at wasteful behavior. And the whole premise of the survey, once I got under the skin of it, was that they were looking at wasteful behavior and making the point that if we were less wasteful, we would be more financially secure. And I thought, ah, oh, now I get the argument. And then I started looking at the detail. And the detail told me that according to their survey, every household in the UK, and there's 25 and a half million of them, were wasting somewhere in the order of 424 pounds worth of food every year. And I thought, geez, that's a lot of money. So then I reached out to our local council colleagues and I said, can you just have a look in a few bins, see what the situation is, try and get an understanding of what the volume of this food waste might be? And we got quite a few of them. We got about 200 of them looking in, looking in the bins. Probably the householders were going, what the hell is going on out there? But they did. And what we found from that was that on average, about 20 to 25% of everyone's bins was food waste. And it went up as high as nearly 50%. So I then thought, okay, we have a problem with the value of the food being wasted. This is also a serious amount of food that's being wasted in the UK. So over the course of the next few years, we did a lot of research. Uh, we reached out to everyone. We, we literally walked the chain in some cases and tried to understand the nature and scale of the problem. And as a result, in 2007, we produced the first report in the world called The Food We Waste. It was a very, very comprehensive study, not just looking at the volume of food waste, but why it occurred. So what were our behaviors? What was happening in the food chain? That was our first step, just understanding the situation in one country. And then we were talking to the government and to the European Commission about this, and they said, you know what? We actually need to understand more about what's happening globally. So I then spent two years seconded to the UK's Foresight Programme, which is fantastic, because they give you a chance to look 30, 40, 50 years ahead at key issues. And they were doing a project on the global future of food and farming to 2050. And they said, OK, let's see if we can quantify food waste globally. I thought, wow, I've only got two years to do this. This is going to be a real challenge. But we, we got stuck into it. And we learned a lot through that process. And then we did some work with the World Resources Institute in the USA and a number of other key partners like the UN Environment Programme. And we started to realize just how significant this issue is. So this was our kind of nothing to numbers journey. So this is what it looks like. So we were really struggling on how to visualize global food waste. And we thought, well, why don't we just represent it as a country in its own right? And you'll see from these statistics that these are pretty startling statistics. So if we treat global food waste as a country, what would it consume? Well, it turns out it would consume 32% of global food supply by weight at a cost of somewhere in the order of 1.8 trillion Australian dollars a year. It would consume 25% of all water used in agriculture, 23% of all the fertilizer used on Earth, and from a health and nutrition and food security perspective, one in four calories produced on the planet. How does that look in other environmental terms? Well, it's the third largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions after China and the USA, and it's unnecessarily utilizing a cropland area the size of China. And this was kind of, if you'll pardon my French, and I know this is live streaming, this was the holy shit moment for me. This is just such a big issue. And we knew we needed to do something about it. So this is a piece of work just to start breaking down and actually starting to understand what this looked like. So for us, we, we actually started to see across different product categories and product groups, food groups, what this really looked like. So you see here, for example, roots and tubers, fruit and vegetables, close to half of global supply is wasted in this world. That's an awful lot of a nutritional deficit. And it represents a very big value, as I've just said. So this is, this is sort of starting to get us to understand where we need to engage, what product groups we need to do to look at. And these were just some of the things that started to emerge from the research. So it was anything from the really, really basic stuff, like countries just simply not having enough grain silos, or there being the complete absence of any sort of cold chain to maintain fresh and perishable food. So that's really basic infrastructure that we needed to do something about. And that is happening now. There's lots of investment going into that. So very simple things at the other end of the, of the value chain, like people simply not understanding food expiry dates. People getting confused about the difference between best before and use by dates. You know, one is obviously 
food safety, one is food quality. Simply not understanding that. So we needed to eradicate some of that confusion as well and really start to engage with consumers around the meaning of these, these labels and also giving them more advice about how to you know, prepare and cook and everything, their food. So a real range of, of different issues we started to engage with. And one of them, and this is something I'm, I'm kind of really proud of, we actually started to look at how do we get all that surplus food, that food that could be wasted, to those that need it. So we work with the World Food Programme and the UN. Uh, we've worked with national governments now, and in Australia we're working with all of the major food rescue and relief charities. And last Friday we held a workshop and they've all agreed to come together to form a new, a new alliance called the Food Rescue Alliance to try and help those communities in Australia to get that food to them. So this is really hot off the press stuff. We're trying to do something really practical, really positive with this, with this agenda. For those of you who are not aware, so the UN has a, a series of sustainable development goals. There are 17 of them which are represented here in the graphic. One of the targets that the UN set under the Sustainable Development Goals is to halve per capita global food waste at the, at the retail and consumer level, so the, if you like, the downstream supply chain, uh, but also then to reduce food loss from farm to retail shelf. So this is a huge target. Which, you know, just think about that. With, with, we're effectively, what we're saying is currently we are wasting one third of all produced, all food produced in the world. And this target is to reduce that by half in 10 years' time. And in, and in reducing food waste, you can see from the other radial diagram, there are all sorts of other benefits as well. Water, better water stewardship, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, a whole bunch of other stuff. Fighting hunger, so zero hunger within the, um, the SDGs as well is a critical target. So this is a really significant opportunity to engage with this target and to get businesses and consumers and others to engage with food waste. So let's kind of drill down a bit. So the National Food Waste Strategy was published by the Australian government in November 2017. And what it was looking at was four core areas of activity. So policy support, what is it the government can do? Anything from regulating to things like tax reform. So one of the things we're talking about at the moment is how do we change and reform the tax system so that those that donate food to those, to the, to those food rescue organisations not only get a tax deductible for the food they donate, but for the services they donate. So at the moment they get it for the food, which is great because that's an incentive to them to donate that food, but they don't get it if they provide a refrigerated truck or some warehouse space with some cold chain facilities. So we're just trying to unblock those sorts of things. Business improvements, there are so many things businesses can do. I'm spending at the moment about 40% of my time with Woolworths, and we are learning a lot together about how to improve what they do and how they interact with their suppliers. So that's kind of a live game as well. Market development as well. So one of the things we need to think about is when we have these unavoidable food waste streams, what can we use these materials for? There are so many things, as it turns out, and I'm not going to spoil Polly's presentations because she's going to be talking a lot about this. But there is a lot of value in food waste streams that we can sort out. Behaviour change as well. This is critically important both in households and in business. So what's the business case look like? Um, so this is a piece of work by an organisation, a collective or a co coalition called Champions 12.3. So this is a group of, of organisations that have coalesced around that UN SDG target 12.3. And they've looked at 1,200 food sites, food businesses, uh, across 200, countries, uh, 200 companies in 17 countries. What have they looked at? They've looked at what is the return on investment when you try to prevent food waste. And the global average, as it turns out, is for every dollar you spend, you get 14 back. In the more developed countries, like the UK has been working on this for 16 odd years, for every pound we put in in the UK to food waste prevention, we got 250 pounds back. So if you ever worked in the food business and you look at the return on investment they're normally looking for, this is way beyond that. So there is a very strong business case. And it's not just around the money either. It's around fighting hunger, cur curbing climate change, conserving increasingly precious natural resources, also improving reputation, in some countries complying with laws, and then upholding ethics and, and um, around food in particular. So it's a very multifaceted business case. So where are we in Australia? And apologies for this slightly busy slide, 
But there's a few things I just want to draw out. So if you look at the, the apple donut diagram, 34% um, of food waste in Australia is emergent in our homes and 92% of that currently goes straight to landfill. So we need to, we need to really change behaviours in households and provide the tools and resources that households can use. Uh, we also, though, have 31% of food, in, food waste in primary production and 24% in manufacturing. Now, this is very unusual as a profile for food waste for a nation state, in an OECD country in particular. Normally, we find that in the uh, developed, developing world and in emerging economies, most of the food waste is sitting in primary production or shortly afterwards, and that's down to things like a lack of infrastructure. In the developed world, normally we expect to see that food waste in homes, but this is a real mix in Australia, which means we need a range of different tools and initiatives to tackle each part of the food value chain. You'll get a copy of this presentation, I hope, so you can look at the detail. And what I wanted to say is that this is the roadmap for the National Food Waste Strategy. It is about to be launched by one of the ministers in the Department for Environment, and it contains a lot of information on the situation in Australia and what we're planning to do about it. So what does that look like? In a nutshell, we've developed a whole series of building blocks to tackle food waste in Australia, some of which are around actually understanding the evidence better. So we have a feasibility study because it turns out that uh, when ministers and officials were looking at the target, no one actually tested whether we could actually feasibly achieve that halving food waste target by 2030. Uh, voluntary commitment programs. So this is about engaging with food businesses from farm to fork and just looking at how we work with them to prevent food waste, a nationwide behaviour change effort, and some sector action plans. So we're doing one with food rescue and relief. The other one we're working on at the moment is the cold chain. Now, I'd always thought of the cold chain as being a safe place for food. But what we're finding in Australia is with the tyranny of distance and some human factors, actually there's a lot of food waste in the cold chain. So it's about, the current estimate is that it's about $3.8 billion of food wasted. Um, just to give you an idea of the scale of that, they think with fruit and vegetable waste, that's about 20%, 25% of total Australian fruit and vegetable production is being lost in the cold chain. So this is a really significant volume of food that we need to improve the performance of the cold chain. So that's why we're doing a sector action plan. We have ongoing research and innovation through the, through the CRC, through CSIRO, through others. Uh, and we need some strong and independent governance here because we need to bring all these parties together. I won't dwell on all the detail with this because I've got limited time, but hopefully when the roadmap is publicly available very shortly, you'll be able, be able to have a look at it. So I wanted to give you a sense of what the art of the possible is in my last few slides. So this is our experience in the UK where we have a voluntary commitment working with industry called the Courtauld Commitment. It's called the Courtauld Commitment because we got all industry together in the Courtauld Gallery. So we were, we were lucky enough to be surrounded by beautiful impressionist paintings as we talked about something which was very, very tangential at the time, food waste and how to tackle it. And we've seen three iterations of the, of the commitment. The current one, uh, Courtauld 2025, is still live. It's running for another five years. But just look at those top line figures for the first 10 years. 28% reduction in avoidable food waste. The equivalent of 12 billion Australian dollars of savings for food businesses and, and consumers. And 11 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent emissions saved. So this is pretty extraordinary, bringing people together in a pre-competitive environment to tackle the issues right the way through the, through the food chain. What's this look like for individual businesses? So Tesco's, for those of you who don't know, is the largest food retailer in, in the UK. It also operates in another eight countries. I sat on their advisory board for about six years just trying to map out food waste. So we had about 550 people around the world in 72 countries trying to figure out where the food waste was and what to do about it. So we did a load of hotspots analysis trying to understand where those big volumes of food waste were. We started out where it was a really painful 3.5% of their total sales were lost to food waste. So this is a very significant commercial driver for them. In the space of six years, we reduced that tenfold because we understood where the food waste was. We established really good trusted partnerships with their suppliers and their suppliers are now doing the same. So they were the first food business in the world to publicly report their figures and they were the first business in the world to set targets. A lot of other businesses have followed that in between times. Just look at uh, the 2018-2019 the, the figures. 
So they've achieved a 17% reduction in food waste across all their own operations in one year, and they've increased the amount of food they've donated to food rescue organisations by 63% in 12 months. That is extraordinary, and that took a lot of effort. So their target for this is that they want to see no food that is safe for human consumption going to waste. They are now 81% of the way towards that target. So this has required a lot of CEO commitment and a lot of effort from them and their suppliers. But, it does, but you can see it is possible to reduce food waste tenfold in, an, in a company and in its value chain if you work hard enough on it. I want to take you through this because, very quickly because this is a very interesting way of looking at it. So one of the first things we did um, in the UK, so I used to work, so RAP, in case you're wondering what RAP is, it's the Waste and Resources Action Programme. It is the body in the UK that advises government on this sort of thing. So we went, we went and talked to Cooperative Food. They're quite a, quite a large convenience retailer. They sell a lot of fresh food. And we said, OK, can we have a look at your potato value chain? And we looked at it, literally walked the chain with every single actor in that chain. So whether it was the buyer and the retailer or the farmer in the field or the person in the pack house managing how, how potatoes were graded for quality, everyone was there on that journey. So the first thing we discovered was actually it really matters what variety of potatoes you grow because a King Edward's potato will produce 10% less than a Maris Piper. So that was the first point of learning. Simply just changing the variety changes the food waste profile. And this is a great comedic moment, the next one. We said, OK, so your product specification says that the perfect and absolutely ideal circumference of a potato is 45 millimetres. Why? <laughs> and there was a lot of spluttering in the room. It took them three months to find a product specification that was written in 1978. No science, no agronomy, no consumer insight. We said, OK, we're going to challenge this. Let's see what happens. And we, we slowly but surely reduced it. So we started off 45 millimetres to 43 millimetres. That almost immediately increased crop utilisation for the potato farmer by 5%. That doesn't sound like much, but that's nearly 2,000 bucks a hectare of increased income. We pushed that more and more. No consumer noticed, two millimetres. No consumer noticed, four millimetres. What can I say? Um, we moved to trickle tape irrigation. How long have we got? Two. OK, good. Um, I can do that. Um, trickle tape irrigation. Uh, so that reduced water use by 30%, reduced energy use by 10%, increased crop yield by 4%, and, and made so a massive improvement in the quality of the potatoes they were selling. We looked at their 15 refrigerated stores. One of them was really outstanding in terms of its performance. We brought the other 14 up. We saved a million kilowatt hours of energy in the first year. And we carried on improving it. So it's all of these things, little bits and pieces in the value chain as you walk through it that you can bring together. And actually what that delivered was for every 50,000 tons of potatoes, there was $1.2 million worth of savings for the whole chain. So that was pretty awesome. And we did a whole lot more of this stuff. We also did a lot of work on understanding and changing household behaviours. I'm not going to dwell on this too much other than to say when you're presented with something which tells you that there are 74 interrelated behaviours that lead to food waste in the home, it's unworkable. <laughs> so what we discovered was that there's actually two that matter. Don't buy, prepare and cook too much and always eat your food before it goes out of date or, goes, or gets spoiled. That's as simple as it gets. And I should say the, the fight with food waste CLC is just done. It's... Uh, first report on this. So we've actually looked at the behaviours in Australian households, 5,272 of them, and we've looked at stated behaviour. We are So this is what people are telling us, what they're reporting food waste to us as, and what the behaviours that lie behind that are. We're now going to look in their bins. <laughs> and see what really happens. So finally, we think this is a really good opportunity to reframe the food waste opportunity. Tackling food waste is the third most effective way of tackling climate change and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It's a way of supporting our hard-pressed farming communities at the moment, improving their efficiency, yields, income and market access. It improves water stewardship. It's a really good way of establishing trust and resilience in the value chain. It helps to feed hungry Australians, and there's five million of them that have, that have experienced food insecurity in the last 12 months, so that's pretty important. It also helps Australian households to better manage their domestic food budget. 
There's a great opportunity to look at new and innovative products, which Polly will talk about a bit more. And actually, it's a good opportunity to put ourselves back in control of at least a small part of our lives right now. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. I am both inspired and horrified uh, by that talk, and I think that's probably what you wanted us to feel. Mark will be back at the end uh, with Polly for questions, um, but now it is my pleasure to introduce our second speaker for tonight, Dr. Polly Bury. Polly is a senior lecturer in food science and a chemical engineer at the University of Southern Queensland. Her core research focuses on the microstructure and composition of food to determine its use in shelf-stable products. Join me in welcoming Polly. Sweet, thank you for that introduction, Emma. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so Mark's told us a wonderful story about how terrible um, the volume of food waste is, and then some strategies we're gonna be working on into the future to try and reduce waste. However, part of the strategy is actually trying to prevent waste occurring in the first place, and some of that Mark did actually talk about. Um, so what I'm here to talk about is actually transforming food potentially into other products, but still being used as food products um, to prevent the waste um, being built up. So what typically happens historically? We tend to have, usually, quite linear supply chains, and they lead to something that our research team, instead of calling waste, calls it food excess and food byproducts. Because until you throw it in the bin, it's not actually waste. It's still a resource, it can still be used, and we can still you know, create things that are useful for people. So we start off with our really nice fresh produce, which I've got a photo up on the top left there. It looks beautiful, it's healthy, it's really good for you. Um, but often what happens over time, we end up with it landing in the tip. And it can land in the tip from households, it can land in the tip or a, a representative of a tip um, from farms, from distribution and from all parts of the food supply chain. So one of the things that our team tends to work on is, um, for those of us in that generation, almost pick a path approach to try and figure out how to divert this food and stop it ending up in landfill. So we want to stop the subsequent waste actually happening. So what can we do? Um, so normally, I've got the little diagram up here, so normally we, and, well, there we go, um, we've got our little crops um, that are produced, and then we make a decision, we harvest and sort them, and as Mark mentioned, we had this very odd standard for potatoes, um, and at that point, that's one of the decisions we make as to whether it can be sold or whether it cannot, and if it cannot, it ends up down in these red boxes, and those are no good. Um, because that what is, that's what eventually becomes waste. What we really kind of want is some of these green boxes, and so I'm going to have a few green boxes showing up in the talk. Um, but typically with food, we want to end up with it being eaten. So some strategies are food rescue, some are actually transforming the raw material into longer shelf life food products, so they've got a bit more time to actually be consumed as well. But during the food supply chain, there's quite a few decisions. Oh, sorry press the wrong button, it's quite a few decisions that happen and we end up going down into these red boxes. So we want to stop those pathways happening. Now I'll, I'll be very quick about this because Mark did go through a few of the statistics, but our team particularly focuses on horticultural produce and that was because of the statistics that Mark put up. It's nearly half, or getting close to, half of the horticultural produce. Now these are some older numbers, but they're similar to what Mark showed from the report um, for the Boston Consulting Group. However, more recent figures that I've seen come out of the US and other places as well, and we are up there with North America in terms of waste, so globally about 45%. North America and Oceania, we're closer to about 50-60%. So it's quite a lot. Um, and that's from um, production to consumption. So the different coloured bars actually represent different stages in the food supply chain. However, as I was saying, recent figures sort of say that, well, that 45%, in some cases, actually happens on farm. So the food that gets produced on the farm, almost half of it may never make it off the farm, which is a real shame, because all the resources have gone into producing that food, um, and it could have some really good use, but these sorts of things happen. So these are a few pictures from events that have happened in the last couple of years. So on the left-hand side, um, we've got a giant mound of tomatoes. This was uh, from a study out of the University of Sunshine Coast, looking at tomato growing up there. 
Uh, and with the study at the time, up to 84% of crops were left in the field, which means only 16% at that time made it out of the farm, which is a lot. Okay? What do you think was happening to the farmers who were having these wastage rates over time? Eventually, they were going out of business, some of them, because that's not sustainable. You can't keep growing that way and having it um, rejected like that. Now, at the time, they were saying some of the reasons were supermarket demands, and that's one factor. Okay, It's only one factor amongst others. Another one, pineapples. So every couple of years, there seems to be a glut of pineapples, and no one knows what to do with them at the time. Okay, um, And so this is a mound of potatoes up in North Queensland um, from a place, Paradise Pines, who's one of the pineapple producers. And one of the issues that they raised whenever this happens is that the processing facilities normally use to maybe produce them into pineapple products don't have the flexibility to deal with ripened pineapples when they don't happen when they expect them to. Okay? So weather events or planning or you know, labour accessibility can affect whether the produce will actually make it off farm. So there's quite a few factors influencing this, and that's why we need a bit of a roadmap to deal with a lot of these different things. Um, and lastly, the one on the right-hand side is a good news story. Um, this was out of WA, uh, I believe, and it was the farmers themselves trying to figure out what they can do with their excess apples. Okay? So there's a lot of initiative now coming out of producers as well, rather than thinking about processes and factories um, alone. So this is some of the reasons why our group likes to focus on horticultural projects. So we have a, a few um, industry players um, and a few farms as well that we work with. Now I talked about some of the reasons why waste happens, um, and so everyone is quite happy to say it's some other reason outside of their control. Um, so some would say, oh, we've just produced too much food. Okay, we will need more food into the future. Uh, limited Oz processing, so historically processing in Australia has moved a bit offshore, it's been reduced, we don't have the capacity that we used to. Energy costs, we have some of the highest energy costs out there uh, globally, so this can sometimes be a bit of a hurdle to keep going. Um, and there's quite a few different reasons there, out of con out of, sometimes out of the producer's control. So they can't control the weather, they just have to deal with the impact that it has on their production. Um, but what we can do, which I hope will work, what we can do is think about other strategies to deal with this food when the excess happens, but plan in advance. It's a bit too late when we've already got that mound of tomatoes or got that mound of pineapples to do something, okay? And the reason being is because we've got short shelf life normally of this type of produce, okay? So when you store your produce, normally you're storing it in the fridge with a lot of it. Um, and that does extend it out to, you know, a month, a few months for some of the produce. So we've got fruit here, and I picked on probably the most commonly purchased ones, the apples, bananas, oranges, so we've got the orange one missing there. Um, but you don't have much time to act if you don't have cold storage. So if you've got your mound of fruit or your mound of vegetables out on your farm, you've got very little time to actually do something unless it's planned in advance. So that's one of the challenges that we're trying to tackle. And if you're wanting to have a big cold store, and a few farms definitely have cold storage as well, that requires energy and bills and so on. Okay? Similar story with vegetables. Again, I picked on sort of, and tomatoes kind of, sometimes a fruit, sometimes a vegetable, depending on who you're talking to. Um, but they last a little bit longer. Okay? Uh, but with the tomatoes, as we're talking about with the Sunshine Coast story, they're sort of similar to that fruit um, story. There. Only one week in which you can do something about it. Okay? So, okay. Now, Mark mentioned tyranny of distance, pineapple story. Um, so, a lot of the pineapples in Australia are actually produced up in North Queensland. There's an area called Rolling Stone up there um, where the dot is close to the pineapple. Now, one of the processes in Australia is actually down further in Queensland, and you can see how long it actually takes, if you can read that, 15 hours, 16 hours, etc., to be able to get that produce. Now, if we're following proper trucking laws, that would probably be a couple of days or so um, that we would be getting the pineapples there. 
But one of the issues, as I mentioned before, factory scheduling sometimes doesn't allow for a farmer to ring up and say, hey, I've got several tonnes of pineapples, can you take them? Sometimes the answer is just no, I can't. I don't have the capacity, not able to deal with it. So one of the things that's needed is a bit of infrastructure flexibility, a bit of process flexibility to allow these sometimes unusual circumstances or atypical circumstances. So how can we prevent food waste? Now Mark's talked about a fair few strategies there, um, so I won't dwell on them too much. Sometimes people say, oh, I don't make so much. Um, I tend to not agree with that so much because we do have a growing population and we do need to keep producing food into the future. Um, ensure all fresh produce is eaten no matter what. Now, everyone likes to ensure that they're trying to eat fresh produce, so fresh is best and so on. But if you have a, a longer shelf life product that's still providing nutrition and is not detrimental to health, I would say that would save you a bit of food there as well. So what our group tends to focus on is preserving and extending the food life to extend its edible or consumable time frame. Um, and we're a big proponent of actually enabling modular processing possibly near the side of where the food excess is generated. Okay? Now, some of the issues sometimes with a factory is that to be viable, you need to have it running all the time and profitable. However, you might have a glut for maybe a few weeks, a couple of months, and so on, and you can't have a factory standing idle for the rest of that year. So one way to do it is to actually have your, your mobile modular um, processes to actually deal with those unexpected gluts and your more central facilities to deal with the regular scheduling. That's one way we can deal with it. So, this is what our group focuses on. So I'll mainly focus on the orange boxes um, and then talk about some of the arrows there. So there are four main areas that we tend to focus on. One of the main ones right at the top is capping our food. So capturing it, preserving it, so we've got more time to save it for use. And a few ways you can do that. You can dewater it, you can add some kind of preservative to it, you can process it into something else altogether. Now we actually focus on uh, dewatering, so separating the liquid and the solids, because the water itself is really useful. And if you do this on farm, what potentially could you do with the water? Feed it straight back in, possibly may need a little bit of treatment or you may have another product entirely. So that's one option there. One of my colleagues likes to actually use it for fermentation, um, so that's one avenue we look at as well. Now with our dried powder, with a lot of produce, there may be 80, more than 80 or 90% water. So with your transport costs, when you've got your dried powder, what do you think happens to them? They drop. Okay? then it becomes a little bit less costly to actually get the produce off farm. When you have tonnes and tonnes of pineapples and you're not getting much for them in dollar terms, it sometimes costs less to just keep it on the farm and not do anything with it. So that's one reason there. Now this is where we start getting to the more technical aspects there, which is extracting and refining. So uh, before I was really working on food so much, uh, I worked with bioplastics. And the really neat thing about some of the bioplastics is you can use them for packaging of the food as well. Uh, and some of them are actually degradable. So you could use some of the byproducts from your food to actually package your food as well. Um, so some of the things we call uh, structural substances, so some of your starches, some of your celluloses, in some cases some of your proteins, they can be used in this manner. So I've got an arrow here pointing to food and materials industries. Now, we've just got these straight arrows, but really what we're trying to establish here is a bit of an ecosystem which enables circular economies. So we've got this excess, we've got these byproducts, we need use for them and a path for them. Okay? So thinking about that. And this is only some options. These are the ones our team focuses on. There's a lot of other options out there as well. Um, and so with the extracting and refining, we can also get into our high value items, which is nutraceutical, pharmaceutical, health, wellness. There's a lot of growth in that market there. And why there is interest in that is selling products into these markets can actually really aid in the profitability of the food production as well if some of the return is going down to the producers. So you keep your producers going and they will keep growing produce as well. Now, some of these things actually already happen some of these things still need to happen. And with the roadmap that Mark was putting up before, 
that will enable some of these things to happen in future. Um, I'm probably going to run a bit long, so I won't fill too much on this. Um, but some of these are actually getting into the fermentation space to create new products entirely. Um, and then we have the Cafe Clean and Feed, which is uh, about animal feed uh, products, uh, as well as soil bioremediation um, and other strategies as well. So instead of going from having a, a sort of supply chain where everything just falls off the end, we end up with more of a supply ecosystem where everything has a place to go to in the end. So that's what we want to try and aim for. So, one of the deciders normally is whether it can make money, because if it doesn't make money, sometimes you're losing money and it's not possible to go forward. So, we've done some um, calculations and some modelling, and we say, okay, fresh is best for consumption and health and all sorts of good reasons, and it usually has a typical X dollars per kilo value. If you create products from that because you can't sell it to the fresh market in time for consumption, you can create other things. Now up in the top right there I've got a little bottle, almost um, kind of representing the nutraceutical pharmaceutical industries. And with some compounds, this is going back to the base produce value, you can almost value it at 4,000 times the value. Okay? But to get to that point it takes a bit of effort, a bit of cost, a bit of energy, a bit of resources. So balancing that against the expenses to get there is something that our models tend to focus on as well. Um, one good thing I would like to point out, because Mark raised it as well, doing good is fantastic. So donating food and making sure there is some kind of return for that, as well as donating services, really fantastic. We want to keep doing that. But number one, it actually doesn't use all the food that's out there. Okay? It doesn't use all the food excess and the food byproducts. And it's not necessarily sustainable without some form, unfortunately, of profitability to keep it going. Okay? So we've got to consider both of those things. So I won't spend a lot of time going through this, but this is what I spend a lot of my time doing. Mapping potential new pathways for products and mapping, I guess, integrated pathways. So say we have at food excess, and I'm going to be talking about potatoes in a moment, we could say a certain percentage can go towards producing one kind of product, another percentage can go towards producing a different product, and so on and so forth. So the green boxes up the top, they were previously those red boxes right at the beginning. So it was a build-up of food material, and we want to send it somewhere rather than it stops. Okay? So some things we can do, um, we can break it down, we can remove water, we can collect that water, do something with it. Um, some of the products that we've been focusing on are fibre. Fibre is really important for your diet uh, and it's a really important ingredient in a lot of processed food products these days as well as there's more demand for healthier products as well. Uh, one other thing we focused on is food grade ethanol. So there's been a real surge, some of you will have noticed, in botanical gins or fruit flavoured gins, or tea even, and so on. Um, so that's one avenue to create a product. But one question I asked my team a few months ago, I would say now, say we produce this food grade ethanol. It can sometimes be used to extract some of our high value products um, within the food. So we could, for example, extract something from fruit that could be used in a pharmaceutical product. What if we took some of this and sent it to an extraction process, which I've got on the other side, and I haven't drawn that in. But starting to think of, okay, and, and the reason why I raise this, you'll see in a moment. So what if we took some of this, sent it somewhere else in the process, because we've got too much of it for it to be food grade ethanol. Um, and then some other things we're focused on, so like food powders, which are really important as ingredients. Um, black salt fly is one area, um, and that's particularly due to certain industries that we've been interacting with as well, uh, and understanding the costs and the resources that's required for that to happen and how it matches up with some of the other pathways. So again, it's a, it's a little bit of a, a pick-a-path adventure, and putting these things together, what's the optimal way that we can use all the resource, get towards zero waste, and make sure that there are returns for the producers only nearly there. Okay, so can we get towards a zero waste? I'll quickly talk about the potato. Um, Mark talked about potatoes. Um, so I had some figures here. What I've got along the x-axis is wastage percent. 
Um, what I've got on the y-axis is profit and loss. And for those of you who can see there easily, there's a red line cutting across. It doesn't take much waste for it to actually start running at a loss. And this was based on figures that was out of the ABARES um, survey, which is how much it costs to produce them versus how much return the producer receives and potentially what cost there might be if those sorts of costs came in, I'm thinking of EPA requirements. Okay, so between 15, 25%, suddenly you're losing money. Now, this is why I raised, maybe we don't want to make everything into ethanol. If you look at some of these numbers, um, and we use the yields in the middle there, we have several hundred million litres of alcohol. We would all be drowning in gin, <laughs> which may be enjoyable and interesting, but not sustainable, and, and you're flood, literally flooding the market, um, which ends up dropping value, which is a counter to what you want to do. Now, the way we figured these out was assuming, OK, all the potato that's wasted, assuming we wasted 5% of the potatoes produced up to 90% of the potatoes produced, just based on that tomato waste figure. Now, we said, OK, if we took all that waste and turned it into each of these products individually, how much are we producing and what is the production rate per day? So it's millions of litres, thousands of tonnes per annum or hundreds of tonnes. And we start seeing that some of these things potentially actually doable on smaller scales, okay? And those are some of the things that we're focusing on for our modular processes. Um, and in terms of value, thousands of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, et cetera, and so on. Um, so again, we want to be using our resource, we want to make sure it's sustainable, profitable, all those good news stories. Um, and this is just a representation of the point I was trying to make before. We start off, say, with our potatoes, Maybe we send some of the percent to produce fibre, some of it to pr um, produce the food grade ethanol, some of it to produce food powder to go into something else entirely further down the track. So there are a lot of options, but me being an engineer, I do need to talk to people who know the business side as well, okay? Because that's what will drive some of it there. So the planned roadmap that Mark was talking about in his talk will help to plan reducing food waste. Modelling of pathways is needed and ongoing for the excess that can't be uh, reduced, I guess, at the consumer end, can't be diverted to food rescue, or those kinds of things. And to create you know, your innovative new products and prevent food waste, we need cost-effective enabling technologies, which is sort of where I was going, but also the guiding policy and regulation that Mark alluded to as well. Um, and to aim further towards zero waste, we need to figure out what are the proportions going through the different pathways. And sustainable products are definitely growing in popularity. So talking about regulation and policy, is this something we need to introduce? And moving towards sustainable products in general. Okay. So um, I hope I've given you something to think about there in what could be done. Um, with the humble potato alone, we tend to look at a lot of other produce as well. So we've been focusing on those poor pineapples um, and tomatoes as well and all sorts of things. So simulating how they would move through those pathways would be a different story altogether, which is why there's a lot of work still in this space. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Polly. Who knew both of you were going to leave us all looking at the potatoes so very differently <laughs> than before we arrived tonight? So I'll get Mark back up to the stage, and we do have some time for some questions. We've got two microphones downstairs and one upstairs. Um, so if you've got a question for either Mark or Polly or both, wave your hand around and the microphones will come to you. Um, yeah, just a question for the two of you. It seems you've got a problem that this um, wasted and spoilt food is a potential resource, but the people who might want to use it don't necessarily know that resource is available, where it is, and physically how to get to it at the time. Is there any sort of social engineering strategies you can think of to, I guess, better utilise a resource that may effectively be available for free? Um, I'll mention something which I was introduced to at a Fight Food Waste CRC event last year. Um, there is a few apps out there, actually. One of them is called Why Waste, with a capital Y. Uh, it actually connects people who have excess food, potentially in their backyard uh, and so on, and they need somewhere for it to go. Um, and so it can be as, you know, 
as fast as someone's got excess food in their fridge and they're going on holiday, someone take it. Or someone has their fruit trees loaded with oranges or mandarins, someone can take it. Um, And it's free, it's usually given freely, they just want to use for it. Some of the stories I remember seeing there was fruit was donated, one lady turned it into jam and then donated that further on. So it was an example of a longer shelf life product and more time spent getting to people who wanted the product. So yes, there are some strategies out there. All right, I cannot see with this light, so whoever's got the microphone, go ahead and ask your question. There's someone up the top. Up the top, go ahead. There's a microphone in the middle. Is the microphone on? Oh, fabulous. Um, My question's to Mark. Um, When you speak about household waste of, say, vegetables, for instance, do you notice that there's um, a higher percentage of waste in fresh vegetables as opposed to those that... Um, the consumers bought frozen? Freezing food like that is just like pressing the pause button on the shelf life. That's, uh, so it is, it, it's, 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 it's a fact, it's more difficult to manage fresh produce chilled than it is frozen. Um, and that is why sometimes the advice you give to households helps them to actually understand how best to store that. So I spent a, a really fascinating six months with the Federation of Women's Institutes in the UK, so a bit like the Country Women's um, Association here. And they taught me stuff about how to manage food that I had no idea about. I did not know you could separate an egg white from the yolk and freeze both. You can't freeze an egg together, but you can do that. I didn't know you could freeze capsicum and still maintain some of that. So some of it's about... Um, The efficiency and the effectiveness of frozen produce is still just as nutritious, but a lot of us like it fresh, so we need to understand how best to store it, how best to use it, and whether we need to do things like batch cooking in the kitchen, which is certainly something my family does all the time. Um, Sorry, if I could just one follow-up then. Mm. Um, Because I'm a big convert to microwaving a bag of mixed frozen vegetables. Um, And if I'd known this when I had a full-time job and young children, my life would have been so much simpler. (laughs) Uh, Having said that, though, um, you you, you mentioned you were working with Woolworths. So I'm just wondering, has there been a change in the store footprint so that the fresh food section of the store has a smaller footprint and and the frozen area is larger so that people can see where the convenience really is? I don't think there has been yet. Um, you know, one of the things uh, that they, you know, one of the key kind of propositions from Woolies is eat fresh. So they're, they're still very much focused on the fresh produce. I think they, um, they do offer a, quite a lot of frozen, uh, frozen foods, um, but I'm, I don't think I've seen anything in store yet that sort of says, you know, that here are the benefits of buying this, this particular food stuff frozen. So maybe that's something we should, you know, we should be looking at. Uh, I know when we, um, when we launched the Love Food Hate Waste campaign, which was the nationwide consumer-facing campaign in the UK, one of the first sponsors was Birdseye, and they talked exactly about the benefits of frozen food. So that, you know, that is something we could probably do more of here. I've got to say, um, can I freeze it is one of my most Googled phrases. (laughs) Next question. Further on the fresh food people at Woolworths, a lot of the fruit and vegetables produced is cosmetic. It has to look right. Mm. But you don't see in Woolworths where there are seconds for tomatoes that aren't quite perfect. Cosmetically, can something be done? Ugly food. Mm. Ugly fruit and veg. Um, I hate that phrase, actually, uh, because it's just as nutritious and and tasty. Um, So Woolworths do have uh, an offer called The Odd Bunch, and you will see it in store, and it is becoming increasingly popular. And certainly over the last week or so, we've seen announcements from both Coles, Woolies and Aldi that they are relaxing their cosmetic quality standards because they've clearly come to appreciate farmers having a pretty tough time right now, and they need to sell as much of their produce as they can. Um, so it does exist in store. I, think, I don't think it's in every store, but it's in most stores now. 
So they are trying to, to, to relax their standards and to make people aware of the fact that just because it's, it might look a bit odd or might, look, might not look as big as they're used to, it's still perfectly nutritious and tasty. Got a question over here? Hi, can you please explain how and if composting factors into your work? Um, so I'm, I'm from Ottawa and we have green bins in all of the houses and I've noticed since moving to Canberra, my waste has gone up significantly. The bulk of the stuff that I'm throwing in the bin to go to landfill is stuff that could be compostable. And that has been really concerning for me. Okay, I'll mention something actually. Um, there are some initiatives and it does depend on your location. Um, so some areas do have green waste um, and I think a lot of it is gardening. One thing I will mention is that I have seen an example up in Queensland of a cooperative that actually has a composter. Um, so food waste, food scraps can come to the composter, um, it gets all goes through its process and then the compost goes out to where it's needed as well. Now there's a lot of food businesses that are actually feeding into this. One of my past students actually has a business where she makes a fermented fruit drink um, and she says all her byproducts tend to go in there and she's a big believer in circular economy. So I definitely appreciate your question because there definitely needs to be more of that um, and that's because with households we tend to have byproducts so people peel their potatoes they peel their carrots they chop tops off things etc and there needs to be some place for this to go so yeah I, t I take your point there needs to be more of that my favorite day is when I have nothing to go in the compost because yes. that means I've used it all um, this is probably going to be our last question before we run out of time this is for Mark um is there agricultural crops that are either inherently more wasteful or draw a higher energy demand? And is there a part in the national strategy to transition away from them or is the strategy to make them more efficient? Wow. <laughs> End on a big question. Um, so there are, so when we, when we look at food waste, so, the, so CSIRO produced a study uh, which looked at fruit and vegetable waste Oh, sorry, fruit and vegetable losses pre-retail. And there are certainly some crops that are more inherently wasteful, you know, wasted, not wasteful, wasted than others. And, you know, tomatoes would be a, a classic case in point. And I think Polly's slide yeah, showed that. Yeah, farm. so, and, and there, there are others as well. So, you know, any, any crop you produce that is, that rapidly loses moisture, cucumbers would be another one. Um, crops that are more susceptible to blemishing, mould, rooting, things like that. So that's you know, it's one of the reasons that I mentioned that potato case study in, in the UK, that um, the reason why King Edward's potatoes were so much better from a waste perspective than other varieties was because they were less susceptible to greening and mould and rooting. Um, so and it, that was very interesting for us because the, the farmer was growing them from the perspective of the yield he was seeing in the paddock what no one had ever done was take a look at what the yield looked like once it reached the supermarket shelf. So I think we need to do a, lot, a bit more work on that in Australia because we've got a reasonable sense of the waste volumes and a, a slowly improving sense of the composition of the waste. We don't yet have a full handle on the root causes. And I think that's something we need to do when we walk that chain uh, as we implement the strategy. As always in science, with our answers, there's more questions. <laughs> um, that is all we have time for tonight. So please join me again in giving Polly and Mark a huge thank you. <laughs> I have no doubt you all found that engaging and enlightening. I'm a food scientist myself, and I still learn things tonight. Um, once again, I need to thank the University of Canberra, our presenting partner, and our event sponsors, Jira at Geostation Wines, Hoburg Catering, and Elite Technology. We appreciate uh, your support, and we thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us here tonight. Uh, we hope to see you back here in April, um, where we will have our next talk in this series on genetically modified foods, uh, which will be presented by Professor, Professor Rachel Ankeny and Dr. Sarinda Singh. Thank you all and have a great night.